great place that's saying something cause I've been through outer space I think Greetings, viewers, and welcome to another episode of Unrepented Geeking. I'm your host, Sean Cronenfeld, and today we'll be taking a look at Disney's latest animated TV offering, plus checking back in with both The Flash and Arrow following their mid-season premiere. And so, without further ado, let us begin. It's gonna get a little weird, gonna get a little wild. I ain't from around here, I'm from another dimension. Gonna get a little weird, gonna have a good time. I ain't from around here, I'm from another. <laughs> yeah! I'm talking rainbows, I'm talking puppies. Ba -ba -ba -ba. At first glance, Disney's newest animated series, Star vs. the Forces of Evil, has elements that recall a wide variety of animated fare, ranging from more recent shows such as Steven Universe and My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, to older classics such as Rin and Stimpy and Rocco's Modern Life. Yet for all the influence some of these shows clearly have had on Star, ultimately it remains its own creation. If the series feels familiar at times, that's less because it's derivative of what's come before, and more because it shares the same wild and anarchic energy that has become so prevalent in the best of Western animation in the last decade or so. Even with just two 12-minute stories under its belt so far, Star vs. the Forces of Evil has already managed to present a rich and vivid world filled with plenty of potential just waiting to be unleashed. The setup for the series is this. Star Butterfly is the Princess of Mooney, a magical world that's located in one of the countless other dimensions that exist parallel to our own. On her 14th birthday, Star is given a magic wand that is the most powerful artifact in all of Mooney, and capable of destroying the entire universe if it falls into the wrong hands. Unfortunately, while Star is intelligent, kind, upbeat, and endlessly brave, at the moment she's also hyperactive and prone to wild displays lacking in forethought, which makes it difficult for her to properly control the wand. And so, for the sake of Mooney and their own sanity, Star's parents decide to send her to a world without magic, i.e. ours, naturally, while she learns to master the wand, since, in theory, away from Mooney, Star won't be capable of causing as much destruction. And if it turns out they're wrong, and she brings disaster and ruin to Earth, hey, at least it won't be their mess to clean up. Upon arriving on our world, Star befriends fellow 14-year-old Marco Diaz, whose natural tendency to play it safe stands in contrast with his desire for adventure and his surprisingly remarkable karate skills. Quickly welcomed to the Diaz home by Marco's parents, Star and Marco are now set to both battle the forces of evil and sometimes just party hard, both here on Earth and across the universe at large. Star vs. the Forces of Evil is the brainchild of Darren Nefsey, who previously worked as a storyboard artist for Wander Over Yonder and the underrated Nickelodeon gym Robot and Monster. Nefsey is only the second woman to create an animated Disney series, the first being Sue Rose, whose pepper and hit airwaves 14 years ago, and if Star is anything to judge by, let's hope the gap between it and the next female helm Disney offering is not nearly as long. One of the big strengths of the show that immediately stood out for me was its lead character, and I particularly appreciate how she's presented as a distinctly feminine creation that possesses a variety of strengths and flaws. Star may love puppies and rainbows and wearing pretty, if still functional, dresses, but that's not all there is to the character by a long shot. Similarly, the show's co-lead, Marco Diaz, brings some welcome diversity to the series without ever feeling like a simple case of tokenism. Marco just happens to be part Hispanic, in the same way Star just happens to be a princess. In the case of both characters, their respective backgrounds help make each of them distinct without being all that defines them. So, for example, Star's parents aren't bothered by her not acting like a proper lady or what have you, and are more just looking to make sure she doesn't destroy the universe, or at the very least, they're part of it. Nor did he point this Marco, or anyone else in the show for that matter, condescend to Star, or make a big deal that she's a girl who can also kick ass. It's just a part of who she is, and the series treats this aspect of her personality in a more or less matter-of-fact manner. 
This may seem like a simple idea, but in practice it can be harder to successfully pull off than it sounds, and Nefsi and the rest of the writers in the show deserve plenty of credit for how deftly they avoid many of the worst tropes that could pop up when trying to create a so-called strong female protagonist. By the end of the two 12-minute episodes to constitute this sneak preview of Star vs. the Forces of Evil, the show is currently set for its full proper premiere sometime this summer, FYI, I've been thoroughly won over by its charms, and I can't wait to see what else Nefsi and her crew have up their sleeves. This is not to say, however, the show doesn't have room for growth. At the moment, Star is quote-unquote merely a good show as opposed to a great one. For all its positive aspects, the series is clearly not yet fully gelled, and lacks, say, the sheer unbridled creativity of a wander over yonder or adventure time, or the deep mythology and emotional heft of a Gravity Falls or Steven Universe. Whether or not Star could develop into a show that attracts an older audience like many of its contemporaries these days remains to be seen, but if nothing else, I think it will absolutely appeal to a younger demographic with ease. Personally, I loved the show's wonderfully realized visual style, and I also found myself laughing frequently thanks to its slapstick and other visual humor. Certainly, there are worse things one could say about a comedy than that it's funny, and I remain hopeful that in the end, Star vs. the Forces of Evil will develop into something truly special. We call him Captain Cole. We can talk about you giving your enemies silly code names later. What are you calling yourself these days, Adam? Nice to meet you. Captain Cold, the reverse flash. The way. Stop doing that. Arsenal. That's what we should call you. Hey, I assign the nicknames around here. Although that one's not bad. Who are you? I'm the justice you can't run from. Having taken a look at Gotham last week following its post-winter break return, it only feels fair to do the same for the other two major DC shows currently on the air. Sorry, Constantine, but I dropped you after episode four, and unlike Gotham, I'm not even curious in a morbid way to check back in, especially for a series that seems all but certainly a dead show walking at this point. Both The Flash and Arrow had fairly major events go on as they closed out 2014, and so it's not surprising that both series are dealing with the aftermath of said events as we return. Of course, in the case of The Flash, this is handled in a more indirect manner, seeing how the reverse Flash does not actually make an appearance, or at least not in his costumed identity in this episode. Instead, we get the return of another iconic Flash character, namely Captain Cold, and this time around he's brought along a friend in the form of longtime Fastest Man Alive foe, Heatwave. Played by former Prison Break co-stars Wentworth Miller and Dominic Purcell, respectively, not only do these two supervillains force the Flash to go fully public for the first time, but they also help bring about the most overtly comic book-like episode that either show in this burgeoning TV universe has yet produced. And I, for one, am not complaining. And little touches like hearing, for example, Captain Cold refer to the Flash as the Scarlet Speedster left me thrilled. That being said, some aspects of the episode's big climax didn't quite click for me. For example, I could have done without Caitlyn being damseled, and more than once the question of why the Central City Police didn't employ snipers against the two villains crossed my mind. Still, these are fairly minor quibbles in an episode that overall continues the series' strong streak. This includes an opening set piece featuring terrific action beats, and if Caitlyn was eventually kidnapped by the baddies, at least she got some nice moments beforehand in regards to the ongoing Firestorm subplot. Also, including a cameo for Jason Rush, who at various times in and out of the comics has also borne the mantle of Firestorm, was an especially nice touch that leaves the door open for all sorts of possibilities down the line. As for the Flash's continuing Iris problem, tonight's episode didn't do much to correct it, but at least it didn't make it worse either, which is something. More than anything, the return of the Flash reminded me of how it's a show whose world and characters I simply want to spend more time in and with, which for me is always the mark of a show doing something right. The Flash is a perfect example of a series with a large cast and lots going on that nonetheless keeps both story and tone in proper balance, which is a lesson Gotham desperately needs to learn. Please, creators of that show, watch and learn. Watch and learn. Moving on, whereas The Flash kept the aftermath of the fight with the reverse Flash as more of a background element, its sister show Arrow didn't exactly have the same luxury, what with it apparently killing off its titular lead. I say apparently because by this episode's end, it is revealed that yes, Oliver is of course still alive. Cue the music number. 
And if that strikes you as a spoiler and or surprise, please let me know in the comment section below because I have some fine real estate in Florida that I think you'd be really interested in owning. Seriously though, while the writers on Arrow could have tried to stretch out the question of Ollie's survival for a few weeks longer, I'm glad they didn't, because I think it would have ended up feeling forced and insulting to our intelligence. What's important is that Ollie's friends, allies, and even enemies believe he is dead, and that we, the audience, get to see how each of them deal with the aftermath. It's a development that brings out the best in everyone, including Roy and Laura, both characters that the show has struggled with at times in the past. It's exciting to see Roy get the chance to step up as a hero in his own right, especially during the big fight that serves as the episode's climax, and which includes some pretty exhilarating staged action for both Roy and Diggle. Laurel, meanwhile, at last fully takes up the mantle of the Black Canary, and I have to say, she's actually fairly convincing in the few moments of the episode we get to see her in the mask. Next week will be the real test of the character, and I'm now actually somewhat optimistic that she'll pass. Laurel may never be the best part of Arrow's Assemble, Symbol, but at the very least she's come a long way from the vestigial hanger-on that she was so often during the series' first two seasons. Meanwhile, once again, Diggle and Felicity prove just why they are such a valuable part of this show, with the latter in particular getting some of her best moments in the entire run of the series as she starts to come to terms with the seeming death of Oliver Queen. Her reactions to both the rest of Team Arrow and her boss and would-be superhero Ray Palmer throughout the episode hopefully presage a new dynamic between Felicity and Ollie once he eventually makes his grand return, and one that should make for excellent extended drama if properly executed. Even the series' signature flashback sequences in this episode felt like they mattered in terms of the show as a whole in a way they simply haven't before now in Season 3. Here's hoping this continues to be the case going forward, since Arrow's writers appear to be committed to retaining the flashbacks, despite many, including myself, feeling they've largely outlived their usefulness. At least in terms of being a week-to-week -week part of the show. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't touch upon the new major villain introduced in this episode, and I have to admit I'm of two minds about the way the show has chosen to approach this character. On the one hand, I think Vinny Jones absolutely nails the role of the intimidating mob boss not afraid to get physical and with a few surprises up his sleeves in more ways than one. Jones brings a real sense of menace and physicality to the character, and if Arrow is setting him up to be the big bad for the remainder of the season, I can only say that I have little doubt he'll be able to fill the role ably. My problem then is less with Jones' performance or even the way his character is written and more with who he's actually playing. For those not familiar with the Green Arrow comic, Jones is playing a more recent GA villain by the name of Brick, who in the DCU proper is, or maybe was, I'm not really up on if he survived the transition to the New 52 or not, a street thug who upon gaining nigh unbreakable skin and super strength, sets himself up as the chief mob boss of Star City. As part of his powers, Brick has redstone-like skin, hence his name, but before gaining his abilities, he was African American, and continued to identify as such even post-transformation. Which brings us to the problem of casting Vinny Jones as this character. Arrow had already whitewashed one major DC villain in its casting of Matt Nabel as Rej Al Ghul, a character who originally was Arabic in the comics. Now, unlike Nabel, whose take on Rage I found vastly underwhelming, he's no Liam Neeson, that's for sure, but at least made up slightly for the race bending by being legitimately badass in that oh-so-wonderful Neeson way, Jones completely nails the part, but that doesn't change the fact that two whitewashings in one season of a show is an incredibly problematic occurrence to say the least. Especially since it wasn't necessary. There are no shortage of African American actors who could have killed in the role of Brick. And conversely, if you wanted to have Vinny Jones on the show, and hey, I don't blame you since again he's generally amazing when playing a heavy, there are no lack of characters in the DCU that you could have drawn upon instead of Brick. I can already hear the apologist making excuses for this, and look, I can't honestly say it completely ruins the episode for me personally, but it's still this added frustration that didn't need to be there. It's not, as some like to make it out to be, a minor issue when this is done to characters who were originally non-white, with Rage and fellow Batfo Bane already having an unfortunate history of being whitewashed when it comes to live-action DC adaptations. Adding Brick to the list only makes things that much worse, and it's especially unfortunate for a series that is otherwise getting so much right. Sadly, at this point, I'm not sure much can be done to actually fix the Brick situation, but nonetheless, the people behind Arrow need to make absolutely sure this kind of whitewashing does not happen again. Regardless, this was a strong return for Arrow, with terrific action and drama alike, and the promise of more greatness yet to come. 
I may be disappointed by aspects of the handling of Brick, but I'd be lying if I didn't admit I'm excited as hell to see where the season goes from here. And that's going to do it for this episode of Unrepentant Geeking. Come back next week when I'll have reviews of the would-be spiritual successor to Earthbound Citizens of Earth and the remastered version of one of the greatest games of all time, Grim Fandango. Please look forward to it. Until then, for Unrepentant Geeking and Channel Awesome, I'm Sean Carterfeld, hoping that all your battles against the forces of evil are successful ones. Till next time.